So my husband and I went to the Bridgerton Experience last weekend and I had a marathon sewing day of making him a jacket. And now this coming weekend, we are going to the Bridgerton Ball, which is a ball hosted by my historic dance troupe, which I am very excited about. And for this one, I decided I needed a new outfit, a new ball gown. Um, so I gave myself about a week to do it, <laughs> which is better than like the one day I gave myself to make his jacket. Uh, so I've been cutting out the pattern and cutting out the fabric um but I'm mainly going to be sewing this in like two days like Friday night and Saturday I have all day Saturday set aside to sew um so let's see how this goes and see what I get done I'm very excited about this design that I have come up with that I will tell you more about right now <laughs> I began researching Regency era fashion plates on Pinterest that had a Bridgerton aesthetic. I was mainly looking for fashion plates in the later 1810s as Bridgerton starts in 1813 and season 2 takes place in 1814. I was looking for ball gowns that had a lot of floral detail and embellishments as that is what I think of when I think of Bridgerton. And then I found it. The perfect fashion plate. It was a ball gown from 1814, and I decided that I was going to recreate this dress, but with a few changes. First, instead of pink, I was going to make it blue because all of Daphne's ball gowns in season one were blue, and blue is the most common color associated with the Bridgerton family. As for fabrics, a ball gown would have most likely been made out of silk satin, but I can't afford that, so I will be making my ball gown out of a poly satin. I went to Joann's first to see what they had, and there was this lovely blue satin, but it was like $10.99 in the yard, and it was only 25% off, and I couldn't use another coupon because it was already on sale, so too expensive. But at Joann's, they did have $1.99 and $4.99 pattern sale, and I, I can't resist that, so I had to look through the pattern books, which is one of my great joys in life, and I did find a couple patterns that I wanted to buy. Most of them were of the vintage variety, because I love their uh, retro patterns. Be sure to stick around, click subscribe, because I have made a dress out of this pattern, but haven't showed it yet, so you're gonna make wanna make sure that you're around to, to see that. Uh, so I already had a lot of fake flowers at home in my stash, but that I plan to use for this ball gown, but I couldn't resist buying a few more that were 75% off. I then went to Hobby Lobby and I found this perfect light blue satin. It was only $5.99 a yard, so I bought it. And then when I went home, there was a deer eating my grass. Now for patterns, I had this pattern forever. It is Butterick 6630. UA of this pattern was absolutely perfect for an 1810s ball gown because while Regency waistlines were all very high, they hit their height in the 1810s before coming back down in the 1820s. So I went ahead and I cut out this pattern. I had never used it before. Uh, I've had it forever. Uh, to the point where I'm actually a little bit bigger size than the envelope said, so we're going to have to accommodate that. As you see here, I am pinning out the bodice piece patterns, but I am going to add just a little bit of extra room. I'm going to add an extra inch to the front bodice panel, and then I'm also going to add an extra inch to the back bodice panel. I'm going to leave the side alone. I think that the side will be fine, uh, and I am making this kind of as a mock-up. It's going to be my lining fabric, but I'm going to go ahead and put this together to make sure that I'm going to have a bodice that, well, fits me before I cut out the nice fabric. So I went ahead and I put my bodice mock-up slash lining together. It's really simple. It's really only five pieces. There's the front, the two sides, and then the two back pieces.
looking good. Once we put a little darts in it like that, looking fantastic. Very happy with that. The back, I don't think I need to add a whole, whole inch to the back. It's overlapping quite a bit and I don't think, I think I could go in and like take almost like two inches off almost because I'm waiting to do buttons. So buttons are hooks and eyes. The patterns had lacing, but lacing was not something that I've seen on any period garment. So not going to do lacing. Um, I'm going to do hooks and eyes or buttons, preferably buttons. I got some really cool gold buttons and then I can match Stephen's jacket, which has gold buttons and then we'll be such a cute couple because we are. Um, but I think I'm going to have to take a few inches off the back here. This is why we have mock-ups, or at least linings, before we cut out the pretty fabric. So, yeah. I think I'm just going to take the inch that I put on off, because of course I want it to overlap, just not that much. Hi, hi yo-yo. How are you? Okay. How is my mock-up looking? Thank you. Really? So like I said, I decided to take an inch off of the back because, well, I didn't need it. I'm taking an inch off of each back piece. So I unpicked the lining because I am going to, well, use it as my pattern pieces to cut out the, the nice satin fabric. I'm also going to lay out my skirt pieces and my sleeve pieces. Also in the 1810s, there was a lot of fullness in the back and there was no fullness in the front. And this pattern did not accommodate for that. It had a very straight back. So that's why I cut out extra of the back skirt panel. So that way I can actually gather it and make it have a full back being more accurate to our 1810s time frame. The first day of sewing then came to an end. I only have one more day to make this ball count. So in the 1910s, it became incredibly popular for ball gown to have this whole net layer over the silk satin slip, which I'm using tool. I'm sure it's not quite the same fineness that this net was made out of in the 1810s, but is what I have and tool is pretty cheap. So uh, these lightweight transparent nets, as they were called, became extremely popular after the bobbin net machine was patented by John Heathcote in 1808, which of course made the material more affordable. So that way it became even more popular. More people could have access to it because it was affordable. So the net could also be like embroidered for further detail and it could have lots of embellishments on it, uh, or it could just be plain. But as the 1910s go on, more and more embellishment become even more popular. So these lightweight t materials, this, um, this net, made a softer, more romantic look to these sometimes stiffer silks and cottons. So it has this romantic quality to these gowns and it goes in, you know, we're, we're about to go into the romantic era. So it's kind of this nice little crossover we see between the neoclassical and the romantic eras with this net softening the appearance of this very neoclassical silhouette. For the bodice, I essentially flatlined the satin fabric to the tulle fabric, making those two fabrics act as one fabric. So here I am top stitching the tulle to the satin. And I did that for all of the bodice pieces and then also for the sleeve pieces. It makes it just a little bit easier to have that act as one. Uh, and then I went ahead and I pressed all of that flat because it was puckering just a little bit. So there are all my pieces, nice and flat. Now it is time to assemble the bodice. There are little darts that are to be taken in the front of the bodice. So there I am 
marking where the darts go, pinning those darts. I then pinned the rest of the bodice together. I pinned the side pieces to the front and then I pinned the back pieces to the side and it was all coming together. Once I had my bodice together, I attach it to the lining, which I constructed separately, and then I'm going to attach all in one piece. I do not know if this is a historically accurate method or not for Regency era gowns. I am not the best at construction for those. So we are going for a historically accurate look, not necessarily historically accurate method, because I would also be having to hand sew this entire dress. Sewing machines were not invented until the 1840s. Well, at least this type of sewing machine that we are used to today. So, we don't have time for that. I only have two, I only had two days to make this ball gown. Uh, yeah. I attached the lining to the pretty fabric and then I turned it right side out and pressed it flat. As I was saying, skirts in the 1810s had a very flat front and then they angled out. It was almost like a triangle shape. It was no longer column-like, it was no longer tubular like it was in the decade before that in the 1800s, but rather a triangular look to the front and then all of the fullness had centered in the center back. So I cut out four back pieces instead of just two so that way I could gather it together and make a fullness in the back. The front piece was perfectly shaped with the pattern, so I didn't really have to do anything. But here I am putting those gathering stitches across the top back of the skirt. Now onto the net. I assembled the net separate from the skirt because I wanted to have lots of movement. The whole point is to have the net move separate from the skirt. So if I flatlined it, that would have made zero sense. Uh, in all the pictures that I've seen, it's most definitely two layers. So constructing the skirt with just tool, having it not attached to anything was a little confusing just because it it's so see-through, it's so lightweight. You know, it's like sewing air almost. <laughs> sewing slightly denser air is what working with tool feels like sometimes but I constructed it and then I layered the two on top of each other which I'm doing here I'm pinning that down to where to make sure the front is in the front the back is in the back because I also had to cut out more layers of the tulle fabric for the back pieces so I could also gather the tulle and gather the back so that there's a lot of concentrated fullness there and then once I've done that I attached the bodice to the skirt All right, so I just got the skirt sewn on. So let's see how. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. All right, and then just come together in the back like so oh almost <laughs> oh 
Well, I, so far, I'm loving this. The color looks amazing. I feel like Daphne Bridgerton and Cinderella, so that's good. Right, Yo-Yo? So as you could obviously see while I was trying on the dress, I have not attached the sleeves yet. So here I am ironing down the sleeve band, which will be at the end of the sleeves. I attach tulle to that as well because I think this tulle has such a, a pretty iridescent shine that just really makes the satin even more magical. This is the sleeve piece. I put gathering stitches along the bottom of the sleeve and also around the top curvature of the sleeve. I pulled the threads to gather it and then I gathered it into that band that I was just ironing. Lucky approves. I then top stitched the band down So I ended up getting these Regency ball slippers for my birthday from my mama and I have always been wanting some ever since I watched Barbie and the 12 Dancing Princesses and they had these special slippers. Of course they had like point shoe slippers, these are not point shoes. But I just absolutely adored these shoes. But it was really these shoes that also gave me an idea for this ball gown and what colored trim my dress should have. So as you can see, the shoes were dark blue with light blue trim and my dress is going to be light blue with dark blue trim. And I just happened to have this perfect satin ribbon that I am going to use to trim the dress. I decided that the trim on the dress looks like it was box pleated so I took all of my ribbon and I box pleated it I made all of this trim myself was it the best use of my time I don't know did I sleep I am pretty sure I slept some before the ball but I mean I I needed trim so you gotta just box pleat all the trim I did box pleat it do a line of stitching down the center of the trim and then attach it to the parts of the dress that I wanted to trim, which was around the neckline, on the sleeves, and then also on the hem of the dress. I attached the trim to the sleeves before I sewed the sleeves together. I found that this worked very well. I then needed to set the sleeve, so I gathered the top <laughs> stitching along the sleeve and set it into my arm. And then I stitched it in on my sewing machine. I essentially did the same thing when I was trimming the neckline of my dress. I went ahead and I made the box pleat trim and then I cut it to the correct lengths. I decided that I was just going to do separate pieces for over the shoulders and then across the front neckline since it was such a square neckline, which again is also very popular for the 1810s. The rounded neckline from the decade before, we don't really see anymore. It was very angular. We have triangles, we have rectangles, we have squares. No more circles and a lot of roundness. 
except for in the sleeves. So I wanted to have a nice crisp neckline, so I did it in three pieces, but when I sewed it together, you really can't tell that it's three pieces. It looks like it goes together really well. So I haven't even put together the back of my dress yet, so I should probably do that to make it wearable. So I did the center back seam and then I put in hook and eyes. Originally I had wanted to do buttons for this dress, but I just ran out of time to do the buttonholes, which seemed to take me forever. So I did some hook and eye tape, which is one of my favorite ways to fasten the gowns of my historical garments. All right, so now I need to hem this. I put the dress that is now able to be fastened up the back onto my mannequin. And of course my mannequin stands at the same height that I would. And I marked essentially where the dress should fall if it were to end on the floor and trim that off. Dresses in the earlier Regency period would drag on the floor by the time that we get to the 1810s. That is not popular, especially for ball gowns because you are dancing the night away in this thing. You do not want to trip. I did leave the back a little bit longer because I got a booty. So that makes the dress stick out and up a little bit more. But then also I liked the idea of it kind of coming down in the back in a little bit more of a triangular fashion. I then sewed all of my box pleated satin ribbon trim onto the bottom of the dress. As you can see, just like it is in the fashion plate, we are really trying to follow the fashion plate for trimmings. So one of the th interesting things about this is that the tool net and right before the line of ribbon trim on the fashion plate and the flowers kind of end right above that so I think it's fun it has like it has layers so I got all of these fake flowers on my flower box some of these were decorations for my different bridal showers which I thought was really fun and sweet that I get to use florals from my bridal showers on a ball gown it's it's really fun uh, it's a good memory to sew onto a dress so I kind of laid it out how I wanted to do it I, I did a pattern of purple pink and blue and then I had to hand stitch all the flowers onto the tool because good gracious there's no way that's going into a machine I then did one little flower up at the neckline because, well, I have to do it. That's in the fashion plate. And then I was ready to go to the ball. But I'm not going to tell you much about the ball because you're going to have to tune in to my next vlog about going to the Bridgerton Ball hosted by LN Historic Dance. So be sure to click subscribe so I can see you next time.